Poso maoni wiak, wai wainan kitana ni mua e yos ki piataya pas notaman e yom MITW podcast. A yos pis piataya pas napi notaman e ne he sikimaka e yos o matname ne ho kihi. Welcome to the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin podcast. The MITW podcast is where you can get the latest information from the Menominee Tribe and our tribal departments with your hosts. Douglas Cox, Menominee Tribal Chairman. Sheena Wapus. And Gary Dodge. On this episode, we'll be discussing the severe weather that we had over the weekend of July 19th. So what the tribe did um, that we'd like to talk about in response to the event that happened uh, over last weekend and days following So under the tribe's procedure, we have the ability to issue statewide emergencies. Those are emergency declarations that are issued in times like this. So on Sunday, that would have been July 21st, is when we actually issued that declaration of emergency. What that requires is that our emergency government coordinator, that would be Ben Warrington, and myself as tribal chairman have the ability to issue that that reservation-wide emergency declaration, and that's what we did. So the reason we did this was due to the storms that hit the area on Friday evening. Uh, Those storms caused extensive damage. Um, We had the entire community, communities basically reservation-wide with power outages on Friday evening. Um, Saturday, that a lot of them rolled into Saturday, and much of that area continued um, past Saturday even. So once we got together on, on Sunday, Saturday evening and Sunday, we realized at that point that we were going to require joint operations to be called, and that was um, Ben's decision as emergency management coordinator for the tribe. Those emergency operations included Menominee County. They included um, tribal police, obviously, Menominee County police, and um, fire departments. So those those groups all came together to help us with response to this, and that joint that declaration was issued Sunday. So that, that started um, a series of things that helped us respond to the event. So the the main thing was that there were most of our communities without power, without electricity, obviously many of them then without water, without food, because after you went a few hours, um, your food's impacted. So the, the fridges are down, the freezers are out. So they most of these residents in these areas that lost extended power lost also all their food resources, which is a pretty big deal, as, as you can imagine. So then Saturday afternoon, um, the second round of storms came through, and those also impacted more of some of the areas that were actually restored at that point, more trees down, more roads impacted, um, and some emergency calls were being handled by by our um, our emergency response people. So in addition, at that point, um, we had one other incident that happened. It was the drowning. So we got a call Saturday afternoon um, that that an individual was in the river and, and hadn't uh, come up. So that, that resulted in two things going on at the same time, which, as you can imagine... Um, really stretched our resources even thinner. So that that was all going on at the same time. My responsibility was to make sure that the emergency declaration that we called in relation to the power outage was being handled properly. Um, The fire department chief um, at that time was handling the drowning incident, and that was handled strictly by by them with tribal police, conservation, and county police. 
all working together. They had some Shauno resources that came and helped as well, dive team. So that incident was being conducted at the same time. That one um, turned out, you know, unfortunately it was a drowning. That was a recovery operation on Sunday and that, that, that was recovered there. So as we continued with the power outage part, um, at the height of the emergency response on a power outage, um, we had all of the community centers, what we call community centers, that stayed open for residents to use as a resource. So South Branch, Zor, um, Middle Village, we used Manosakia. Um, here in Kashina and in Neopit, we used um, tribal school. Those were all the resource, we call them resource centers that were open. Those are all ran on backup power. So even though the communities were out of power, the community centers run on, on generated backup power. That includes electric. Uh, fortunately for the middle village, Zor, in the Opic communities, they're on community water systems by the wells and the towers. So fortunately, in those communities, we continued to have potable water that was serving the, the residents even without power. So that was helpful. Um, but those community centers opened up and we started to push resources to those community centers through our emergency government personnel. So immediately we were able to, to go out and get water. So we delivered cases of water to, to all the community centers. Um, we started to get food to the centers on Sunday. We started with some non-perishable stuff, um, but then Red Cross um, was contacted and they were able to help us. So Red Cross made, I believe, three deliveries during the outage to the community centers with, with food boxes and those were um, really well received. It, you couldn't keep the center stocked with that food that we were delivering there. That's how much in demand it was. Um, so that, that, that was um, a big part of it. That, that was an important part. And again, the entire reservation was impacted by this. Not everybody for the whole length, but again, you know, you think about how big and spread out we are in our communities other than the, the villages but um, like South Branch it literally goes from as you go up 55 all the way up to South Branch County AA, County M those are scattered residents that are hard to serve to begin with and really hard to communicate when an event like this happens so all told you know when on reservation, we have about 4,800 residents. A good number of them, um, of us, were impacted over this event. And it was, the response was not not really rapid just because of the way the response was, but it was a really good response. Um, the fire departments, emergency government, the county, um, our own staff, our intergovernmental affairs office stayed right in the operations center and did daily updates that was pushed out via Facebook and people were able to get updated that way. So the response was, um, w was pretty well done. Um, certainly we had a lot of folks that still had concerns and, and still hard to reach some of them. But um, again, it, these are these are the things that we go through in events like this. And as we experience these, we we take the next steps to prepare for the next time this happens again to make sure we we learn from the lessons that that we've experienced through this one. And again, American Red Cross who provided meals to the locations and Salvation Army also came in on uh, on Monday. Um, along with a visit that we had from the Lieutenant Governor for the state, um, Mandela Barnes, who visited tribal school. That was our feeding center location on Monday. We had one big gathering of folks um, to offer them food. 
transportation got involved and bused people up there to tribal school, and the lieutenant governor visited that site on Monday. So it, it was kind of the culmination at that point because a lot of folks were coming back online, and um, most everybody at that point were back up with power. But the interesting thing is that even though they were power was back, as I mentioned, all those resources that they lost during the outage, there's still a lot of hungry people out there, and they were coming in to, to get that to, to the center to get some food. So, yeah, that's kind of where, where it's at. We'll be right back with some tips to be prepared for the severe weather and power outages after a few words from our tribal departments. This is Menominee Nation News, and I'm Josh. And I'm Chris. Some newsworthy events from July that made the paper. Longtime politician and activist Ada Deer and others are actively campaigning to get stronger and additional sentences for Menominee tribal members recently indicted in a massive timber theft operation. Community development says it is dealing with an increase in vandalism, and much of its cleanup efforts take away from things it would rather be focusing on. Several organizations from the various tribes throughout the area that promote youth and healthy activities have started reviving the game of long ball, and a few events have been held at the Menominee Indian High School already. On July 7th, several area musicians and artists gathered at Veterans Park for a Celebrate Our Waters concert sponsored by the community rebuilders group Minaconikin. The concert looked at some of the environmental and cultural aspects of water and was also used as another opportunity for many of the participants and organizers to state their opposition to the proposed Back 40 mine. Several Menominees also took the first of what is hoped to be many canoe trips down the Menominee River at the beginning of the month in order to savor and promote the environmental and spiritual aspects of the river. Several volunteers from the community and the traveling missionary group Rural Compassion worked on several projects this month, most notably converting the unused Pado Fish baseball field in the White City area to a park for children and families that will be offering many things to do while also incorporating natural elements. The Menominee County UW Extension 4-H program has recently teamed up with the area First T chapter in order to get more Menominee's youth interested in golf. And besides fundamentals, the kids are also learning some personal and social skills from the game that they can apply to their everyday lives. Olympic wrestler Dennis Hall stopped by the Menominee Reservation for the eighth year for his two-day camp that teaches area kids the various fundamentals of wrestling. A few noteworthy meetings took place. Mainly, the Budget and Finance Committee looked at ways to deal with a projected shortfall, and the Menominee Tribal Legislature and Menominee County Board had their joint meeting. Menominee couple Drew and Jeremy Lacefield recently started the business South on Main, which sells and promotes Drew's love of beating with Jeremy's love of collecting vinyl records. There was a second go-around of Culture Camp, where kids learned various aspects of their culture and growing into responsible citizens. Once again, the camp ended with games of lacrosse and chinny that served as community healing events. The month ended with an early start to the powwow weekend with the Menominee pageant, the legend of Hiawatha, being staged at the Woodland Bowl the night of July 31st. New issues of Menominee Nation News are available every other Monday. Our next issue will be available Monday, August 12th. The deadline is Wednesday, July 31st. The following issue will be available Monday, August 26th, with a deadline of August 14th. You can also receive updates by subscribing to our e-newsletter. Text the word Menominee to 22828 to get started. For more information on advertising and subscriptions or to share a story idea, call 715-799-5167. For Menominee Nation News, I'm Josh. And I'm Chris. Today with us, we have Dave Greeno Nakwa, yes. and um, he's going to talk to us about some things that Historic Preservation has been up to. Uh, yes, um, recently at Historic Preservation, we, um, we had two Menominee Youth Culture Camps, one in June and one in July, and we had about 30 uh, Menominee Youth 
in both camps. And it was a week of um, cultural activities. One was at Wiki Falls, and the other one was at Lamote Lake. But within these camps, our main focus is to help teach the kids their identity as Menominee people. And um, by doing that, we offer Menominee language, Menominee arts and crafts, traditional games, um, prevention topics, AODA. Uh, the tribal police come in and speak to them. Uh, they do some field trips also to archaeological sites on the reservation. And they go out and harvest traditional plants with Bonnie McKeeran, who was a tribal member. These camps are become really popular with uh, the Menominee youth. And about five years ago or six, the uh, tribal legislature saw what a good job we were doing at these camps and wanted us to do two camps. So uh, we started doing that, and um, it really worked out really well. Um, reason why we didn't go to Wakey Falls, the second camp was at the high water and safety reasons, but we added that while chasing him on Lamode Lake, which really worked out good. We want to continue to have these camps, and we've added a family camp also, of which we do in the fall and the spring, and um, in the fall, of course, uh, for the Menominees, it was the time to harvest the wild rice. And we have a one-day family camp of which we process uh, wild rice and get the family involved. And in the spring, we want to do, of course, it's maple uh, sap uh, harvesting time. And um, we want to... Um, have another camp in the spring so that family can get involved in that process. Some of the other things coming up this year for historic preservation is uh, the Lumberjack Breakfast, which is the first weekend in October, and that's a really well-attended event, and we've added the Heritage Day also with that, which we have... Uh, several workshops, Menominee language, wild rice process, traditional plants, and of course the breakfast. But on that second day, well, first day also was the Miles of Art. And we've been part of that now for the past two years, be our third year. And again, we invite the um, Menominee artists to um, come to the Logan Museum to display some of their arts and crafts, and some of them also do demonstrations. Uh, we had last year, we had um, black ash basket making, and um, it's well attended also. It's a kind of a regional um, cultural event, and uh, we hosted that site at the Logan Museum. There's different sites in Shawano also, in Gresham and surrounding area at the same time. But we have a lot of visitors come to that also. Some of the other things we'll be doing, hopefully we're going to have um, some crafts workshops. Uh, I know um, we've been working with a tribal elder to come and do a finger weaving with a yarn, which is a cultural activity that's um, coming back amongst the tribe. And we might have a snowshoe uh, making workshop also, so that's pretty much for the for the winter months, um, and we get ready for the sturgeon feast and celebration in spring. Um, again, the uh, spring migration of sturgeon uh, uh, historically and traditionally is very important to the Menominee people, going back to the creation story. The Menominees honored the uh, sturgeon, uh, thanked the creator for 
letting the sturgeon come amongst us to provide sustenance, uh, medicines, and a number of different uses the sturgeon had. We have the sturgeon feast and celebration in April, and um, we try to um, recreate the uh, sturgeon ceremony, which took place after the creation of our tribe. It was said that first, one of the first things they did was serve a sturgeon, and after the first catch of sturgeon was a ceremonial offering. And we try to recreate that here on the reservation and keep that going, uh, or revitalize that uh, celebration amongst our people. Um, and again, we have a, a powwow that goes with it. We have a water walk. Uh, the ladies do the water ceremony and have a water walk. And uh, we have traditional dances at the powwow. And one main dance is a fish dance. Uh, and it mimics the movement of the sturgeon up the river to spawn. And a um, very popular event for a people, a cultural event. And again, attended uh, by a lot of people from the surrounding area. For these upcoming events, is there some place that people can look for for their information when they're coming up closer? Um, sure, yeah. We, we have a cultural museum website. Uh, that we post things on, and um, we have different uh, advertisements, and uh, we have flyers and things of that sort. Okay. Also, this is Anne Marie Johnson, Menominee Indian Tribal Wisconsin's Director of Lending and Tribal Taxes Department. This podcast is about habits that build your financial wellness and financial wellness services offered at Lending and Tribal Taxes. More information can be accessed at Smart About Money, or SAM for short, website at smartaboutmoney.org. First, let's start off by defining what financial well-being is. Financial well-being can be defined as a state of being where you have control over day-to-day, month-to-month finances, have the capacity to absorb a financial shock, are on track to meet your financial goals, and have the financial freedom to make choices that allow you to enjoy life. Keeping this definition in mind, Sam suggests that these guiding principles for structuring your financial habits. One, spend less than you earn, bolster your savings, and reduce your expenses. Remember, just because you have something doesn't mean you need it. Number two, save for future spending. Get yourself into a habit of saving. Start simple by taking advantage of any automated savings or investments that exist. Then begin your routine of checking in as you get closer to your goal. Number three, only borrow what you can afford. Don't deny yourself, but avoid spending for an outward show or status symbol. Number four, grow your money. Contribute as much as you can to your employer-sponsored retirement plans, especially since the tribe makes matching contributions. Number five, boost your earning capacity. Even as your earnings increase, try to live off a set income and add to your savings or investments. Allowing your interest earning accounts to grow will help you offset any downturns or emergency expenses. Number six, protect what you have. This applies to not only insurance for yourself, your property, and income, but also your investments. At the Lending and Tribal Taxes Department, we have instituted a financial literacy component as a foundation to our programs and to assist our tribal members. We are excited to offer this service, which allows individuals and families to learn about their overall financial wellness. What you can expect at the appointment is a complete client intake forms and signed disclosure forms. You will also learn how to set up a free tool to access and monitor your credit report. Our staff will assist in reading your credit report as well as provide advice on how you can improve, maintain, and build your credit. We will also assist in evaluating your monthly budget to determine ways you can cut expenses and improve your savings. As an outcome to your visit with us, you will receive a complete toolkit that includes credit information, a household budget, and an action plan you can take with you. We will also provide you with a certificate of completion of your financial wellness session. Afterwards, we will be available as a resource for you should you have any questions. We are here to help. This service is free to our tribal members, and this service can be conducted in person or over the telephone at your convenience. We look forward to assisting you. If you have any 
interest or if you have any questions, please contact our department at 715-799-5139. Why want it? With us today, we have Mike Wapoos from the Youth Services Department, and he's going to tell us about some of the summer programming that they have going on. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks, guys, for having me uh, on this podcast again. So mainly this summer, the staff has stepped it up and has uh, challenged themselves to do more programming. So uh, one thing that's occurred that has never been done in the past is we have a complete summer calendar. And with every working day, because some of the uh, days are a holiday with the tribe, so the the rec center will be closed on those days. But (coughs) since June, July, or so far in July and in August, they have uh, daily activities Monday through Friday, uh, 2 to 4. So, for example, this past week, uh, they did uh, glow-in-the-dark slime. Uh, They had book club yesterday, conservation, fishing presentation, and homemade Play-Doh and solar oven s'mores. So those are the activities. Uh, upcoming community events that my staff is all, or that the Youth Services Department will all be a part of are the Youth Olympics that is going to occur on Thursday, uh, August 1st. It's coming up quickly, so all the other youth service providers, uh, the PD, CRC, uh, CMN, uh, I know I'm forgetting some other ones, but the events can registration will start at 8 a.m. on August 1st, and the event will start at 9. So again, it's uh, for kids kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. So uh, we have a community event with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, that's one of our annual block parties. So it'll be Wednesday, July 31st at the Boys and Girls Club at their new facility in the yard. So weather pending because it's an outdoor activity. So if if we have bad weather, uh, we'll reschedule, but we'll let everybody know just in case uh, of the new date. So everybody be on the lookout for that. It's just a uh, drug-free, alcohol-free f- uh, event for families to come to. Uh, then the next block party after that will be Wednesday, August 20th, and that will be at the Kashina Rec Center. Uh, times for both of those block parties are 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, everybody's welcome. And again, if they are chug an alcohol free event um just bring your family friends come listen to some music come visit have a good time there'll be food at both events um and upcoming on august 14th will be our fear factor that event scheduled to occur uh, um 5 p.m to 8 p.m over at the menominee rec center so um each team must have four players. It's for ages 10 and older. Uh, we'll have prizes for first, second, and third place. Uh, children or youth, 17 and younger, need to have a parent permission and liability waiver signed. All participants are going to receive a T-shirt for participating in our activity. So just an update on our Johnson O'Malley Core program. Uh, core stands for Career Opportunities Readiness Explorations. Uh, the program began on July 8th, 2019, and it's going to wrap up on August 16th, 2019. Uh, currently, we have uh, 10 kids that are in the program that have uh, so far stuck it up. Uh, other places where they've they've job shadowed uh, so far are the Miami Chapel Enterprises, uh, the Chairman's Office, uh, the SDI Department over at CMN, Historic Preservation, uh, Menominee Tribal Police Department, Menominee County Sheriff's Office, our department, uh, Tumbleweed, and Complete Canine Care, and finally the uh, Job Center o- that's located over at CMN. So this is unique because we've never have been able to do job shadowing. We've taken the kids' uh, expresses or where, where they were able to talk about their interests, and we tried to match them up. I know. Uh, so far, we were supposed to have, I think, everything planned out, but some of them, unfortunately, weren't able to do that. So we're going to move in people to have guest speakers. So the kids come in Monday through Thursday. They work 20 hours a week. So so far, we've received some pretty good feedback from them. And with the unfortunate bad weather we've had from the big storm knocking all the power everywhere, the youth have uh, helped out, have done their community service program and, and willingly um, helped out wherever they could. And also have uh, 
distributed water and cooling packs to elders on the week that we had extreme heat. So um, if anybody has any more questions about any of our program or activities, um, they can call 715-799-7099 and that'll uh, get you through to the uh, youth services staff. Uh, if they want to call the rec center directly, uh, it's 799-5135. Do you have any like uh, tips for the community members to, um, you know, be prepared. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing we experienced um, during this period was the communication gap. So in the outfit, for instance, their power went down. So you would think, well, we always have our cell phones. We can call anybody because they're not dependent on power. Well, we found out that our cell tower up there is run by battery backup. So that battery backup on a cell tower actually only lasts X amount of hours. So when that battery backup goes down, the tower becomes unavailable, and people with cell phones, there's, there's nothing. So you've got no power. You've got um, limited water resources. You've got limited food resources. And now you don't have communications either. So the best thing I, I could say, and, and again, you're limited mobily as well because of some of the trees that were down, but the best thing is to check on your um, your neighbors, check on your family members. If you have them and you know they're in them areas, the best you can to check on them is the best tip initially that, that we could give. Obviously, you don't want to travel out when things are hazardous yet, but that checking on people is key and trying to get people to make sure that they're okay, especially those, again, those that you know need care, the, the, the young and the elders, those that are sick. You know, we found some of that, that there were people on electronic resources like um, uh, the, the uh, portable chairs, the, the electronic wheelchairs. People were calling us saying, hey, my chair's going to run out of power and I'm not going to be able to get around in my house. Um, breathing machines, um, oxygen, all of those kinds of resources that you don't think about initially all became evident. We had to find a way to provide them those resources and, and find out who they were in the communities. You know, Are there a lot of people on oxygen in our communities because sitting in a command center, we don't know. So getting emergency medical staff involved, finding out who those were. We actually had volunteer fire department um, have the ability to literally go door to door. So we broke, we split them up in every community and they traveled around each team and literally went door to door checking on people. And, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, the other tip, I guess I would I would say is if People have their own generators. Um, obviously, it's a big expense, so not everybody can just go buy a generator. Um, but if you have your own or have the ability to get one, is to have that generator um, available for times like this. I know, um, I know we used one. So personally, we were without power for from Friday night till Saturday evening, so 24 hours. You know, ran a generator to keep the most critical resources going, the fridge, the freezers, um, charge the phone. So that, that was something that, that I heard from a lot of people. That's what they were doing. So that, that was a good one too. So that, that'd be a good tip. Keep your own stock, if you can, of extra water always. Um, and a little food cash, those non-perishable food items. Um, if you can keep them on hand for times like this, that's a good idea. <clears throat> so again, I think that the response was was excellent. Um, we know that there's likely still a need out there in the community due to the food loss. So we've got some external groups helping us currently as well. There's some volunteer groups um, outside of the reservation that are willing to help. I think they may have sent a link on Facebook for us today. So if you watch the tribal Facebook page, you'll see some of them links. Um, the food resources should be available like at the food pantries. 
Uh, there's information in the link. So, so we're also looking for anybody that's willing to contribute or donate to the food pantries to do that. <coughs> Our food pantries here, um, one in Kashina, um, I believe at Food Distribution, and one in Neop, and I believe that one is at Tribal School or at the church. So the contacts are there in the link. Um, any food that can be contributed or donations will help in that. There's an external group doing that as well right now for us. So there'll be some extra food for people. We will be back with some information about the powwow after a few words from our tribal departments. My name is Shannon Chapman, and I'm the Menominee Tribal Education Director. So, Shannon, can you tell us what the Education Department is about and when it started? Well, the Menominee Tribal Education Department is one of many community resources that work together to support the overall vision statement of the Menominee Tribe, which is we envision the Omat Nominewa as a strong, healthy, and proud nation living in accordance with its culture and beliefs and possessing the resources necessary to be successful in achieving, achieving our goals. The Education Department supports this vision statement through allocation of resources for higher education and providing ongoing support to Menominee tribal members in the workforce so that they may achieve their educational and professional development goals. The Tribal Education Department has three full-time staff. I've served as the director for three years now. We also have Jen Tamau, the program assistant, and she's been with the department for 40 years. And Julie Schultz is the adult education coordinator and GED instructor. She began nearly two years ago. Tribal education was literally built up from the ground when it started in 1975. It was led by Virginia Nusky for 41 years. And the education committee and staff initially helped form the policies and procedures under contract guidelines that are still in use today. What services does the uh, education department provide? The Tribal Education Office administers three programs. We have the Adult Vocational Training Program for students seeking a certificate or a degree from a technical or community college. We also have the Higher Education Program for students seeking a bachelor's degree from a four-year university. And we have the Adult Education Program, and that is for work-related development and individuals seeking a GED. Um, can you explain what the programs are and what they offer? Sure. The adult vocational training and higher education programs provide grants to degree-seeking students attending post-secondary institutions. The programs serve both new and continuing students. We provide limited student support in the following areas. Financial aid, admissions, transcripts, and we also monitor student progress through grade reports, and we adv advocate for students through their college's financial aid staff as well as their college counselors and advisors. Our program also has limited resources through tribal supplemental funds, which assist individuals who are pursuing master's and doctorate degrees. I'm also involved with local high schools providing presentations and documents to the students in order to inform and assist them as they prepare for their post-high school plans. This includes information on financial aid, scholarships, and tribal grant information. I also work with partners to host college night events twice a year for the community. Our adult education program provides full-time GED instruction in partnership with North Central Technical College. The instructor, Julie Schultz, also provides skill building and test preparation for tests such as the ASVAB to support adults needing to build their skills in reading, writing, and math. Julie's office is located in the lower level of the College of Menominee Nation Culture Building. She also provides instruction off-site on request at other tribal buildings. Limited funds are also available for work-related professional development. We can assist with the cost of registration or tuition books and fees for workshops, seminars, and courses. What are the requirements for each program? Um, First of all, please note that the tribe does not provide grants for students attending for-profit schools. You can Google for-profit schools to obtain a listing of schools considered for-profit, and this is due to the high loan debt that students incur and non-transferable credits. We provide grants to adult students who are one-fourth or more degree tribally enrolled Menominee, who are accepted for enrollment or already attending an accredited college or university program, and who have completed the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid, and who have a definite financial need. 
Once students receive their grants, they have a requirement to maintain a 2.0 grade point average or better each term. What are the success rates of the graduates from each program? Successful Menominee graduates from 1976 to 2019. We have the following numbers of completions on record in the Education Department. These are confirmed completions according to our tribal grants. Many more students ha may have completed but have not notified our office. We have 95 advanced degrees, which include seven Menominee with doctorate degrees, six Juris Doctorate degrees, 82 Menominee with master's degrees. We also have 579 Menominee tribal members with a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. And we have 466 technical certificate completions. When is the best time for students to start applying for grants and scholarships? The scholarship season is typically from October through May, with the months of January through May having the most deadlines. After June 1st, scholarship season is basically finished. Many students wait until late spring or summer before the school year, which is too late. My advice is to start looking for scholarships now for the 2020-21 school year. Create a timeline of which to apply in which order so that you are prepared. I also advise that students start writing essays now before the school year begins and students get too busy with homework. Write a good heartfelt essay and tweak it according to each scholarship's requirements. Does the Education Department provide help with filling out grant and scholarship applications? We do help with the grant applications. Um, the only grant that we have on file at our office is the BIA grant, which is also considered the tribal grant. We do provide assistance with that. Um, we provide limited assistance with scholarship applications. Each scholarship has its own requirements, so um, we do help with students locating scholarships with um, that they want to apply for, and we also have held scholarship writing workshops to assist students, but overall, the scholarship application process is up to that student to complete. There are numerous scholarships, resources, and other educational opportunities available to support tribal members in their educational endeavors. We have a, a tribal education newsletter, which comes out a few times a year, and a Facebook page to share information and resources with a wider audience. Also, in terms of help with financial aid, the, co the College of Menominee Nation Student Services Department has computers and personal assistance for all students, even those who are not attending CMN, to receive personal assistance with completing their FAFSA. For the upcoming school year, students need the 2017 tax returns. Give CMN a call at 715-799-5600 for assistance. How can uh, people contact you who are interested in your services? Um, the Tribal Education Department is located on the College of Menominee Nation campus. We are located in the Culture Building. We are the first doors as you walk into the building. And Julie Schultz is located downstairs. That's where you can find the GED classroom. The numbers that you can reach us at are 715-799-5118 or 5110. Otherwise, you can find our email addresses on the tribe's website, and you can also access our handbook and applications on the website as well. We also have a list of scholarship resources available on our webpage. Poso, my name is Nancy Boyd. I work with the Food Distribution Program. Did you know you may qualify for USDA commodities? We have a 20% deduction from wages. We deduct dollar for dollar for child support and child care expenses paid out. We have a $400 per month shelter utility deduction. We have deductions for some elderly disabled person's medical costs. We service Langlade, Okano, Shawano, Wapaka, and Menominee counties. We serve all federally recognized tribes, enrolled members, and first and second Menominee descendants in the above counties. Menominee first and second descendants are eligible at the food distribution programs in the United States if they live within the program service area. You cannot receive food share and USDA commodities in the same month. A lot of people don't realize that the food distribution program has changed significant throughout the years. We now 
have fresh produce, potatoes, carrots, onions, a large variety of vegetables and fruits, apples, oranges, cherries, grapes. And we also have a lot of frozen meats available also. Pork chops, beef roast, hamburger, bison. There's a huge variety. Come on over and check us out. If you are interested in applying, please call 715-799-5131 to see if you qualify. Have a good day. On this episode, we have our tribal archivist, Monique Tindo, with us. So what I brought with me here today is a couple items of interest that I had talked about in the last podcast that I was here and that is a document from the old boarding school here, and it's dated for 1894. And what it shows is it is a voucher. And that you can tell, I'm going to try to describe this for our listeners, like the paper is is thin in weight and it's discolored. It's kind of like a, like a tannish brown in color with some water damage. So there's like spotting here and, and it's printed off, um, a form and it reads voucher number nine, abstract F issues to the Menominee boarding school by Theo H. Savage, that's Theodore, and he was a U.S. Indian agent at the time. And it's for the Green Bay Agency during the third quarter of 1894. And what this is, is it lists rations that were provided to the boarding school for that quarter. And what we have here is, it says... Please deliver the following supplies for sustenance of 112 scholars at the Menominee Boarding School at this agency during the week ending March 3rd, 1884. So this is what we find is um, with some of our archival material, our discrepancies. Everywhere else on this document, they have scratched out the pre-printed 1880 and and replaced it with 94. And there's two areas in this document where they didn't make the correction. They just left it. They forgot to change the, the 8 into, the, into a 9. So we're going to say that this one is 1894 just because of the two corrections that are here on this document. And we can always... Um, double check this information by going into the um, Department of Interior annual reports. And those are all digitized now and they can be found on Google Books. So um, if anybody wanted to look further into this particular year, they can just go on Google Books and put in uh, Department of Interior annual reports, Menominee Boarding School, 1894, and then they can cross-reference it to 1884, too, and um, make sure that the numbers of the scholars match. And then um, in a space here, it's, it's supposed to be for the teacher, but actually um, the person that had signed it here is Leslie Watson, and she was the superintendent of the school at the time. So below here um, in the middle of the page it says total number of rations, 784. And it lists sort of like a grocery list, number of pounds and articles. And they had like four pounds of bacon powder. And they had 75 pounds of pork, uh, 35 pounds of salt. And here they crossed out beans and they put in hominy. Okay, so more culturally. Yes, yeah, so they that that's one thing that's interesting is like um, that they chose that they chose hominy because it was more of a cultural form of food, traditional form of food that pertained to the community, and 
Then there's uh, 650 pounds of beef, uh, 25 pounds of coffee, 75 pounds of sugar, 50 pounds of cornmeal, 7.5 pounds of syrup, 75 pounds of dried fruit, and they have written in here peaches, 4 pounds of tea, and 854 pounds of flour. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and one gallon of vinegar. What's interesting here, looking at the rations, that kind of gives us an idea of like how our diets had shifted and became more of the assimilated American diet versus... You know, a lot of these children that were here at the school who were brought up, you know, living off of the land based on, you know, what their family could hunt and grow and gather, talking about gardens with seeds that, you know, have been grown by Menominee people for thousands of years. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, like, living away from home and having to eat food from a different place. I can only imagine... Um, how their experience could have been, yeah. you know, just by changing diet and how that can like really affect your stomach and give you pains and everything, or even go into the washroom. And so around the same time that I found that um, boarding school ration ledger, I found these slides in the drawer. And... It's like they're all numbered here. They're numbered in pencil. And this is like the first one in the series. This is showing one of the deer high tanning classes that Jane McConish taught. That's really awesome. And like the picture quality on this slide is really, really good. So that one's a black and, is that one a black and white one I yes. handed you? So here's another one that's in color. And it's showing the beaming. And the beaming, you can see there, um, it's like working with a, it almost looks like a wooden rolling pin. But it's, it's just like a wooden tool that they use to rub the hide. And what they're working on, it's not like a sawhorse, it's like a mule, what they described it as. And then here in the Menominee Tribal News, August... 1997 on page six there's actually an article about one of the classes okay and what it describes is like the entire process let's see and these these like newspapers are so valuable because um in here there's like photographs of the powwows and basically everything that was going on in the community at the time and some of the pictures that are here in the newspaper are actually similar to the slides that we have. So they must have used those. Yeah, and I'm thinking because there's one picture here where it's uh, Jane and she's smoking the hide. And they're, they're um, labeled. They're labeled in her number. There's one that's uh, titled uh, Advice. So she must be giving one of the students advice on how to proceed, like in the the stretching of the hide. And then there's one where they're collecting the rotted wood. And in this news article, uh, she talks about the different types of rotted wood to use and like how they'll determine the color. And one type of rotted wood she mentions is uh, yellow birch. And she says that one will give like a, like a golden coloring to the hide. So yeah, look at this one. This slide here matches this photograph that's here in the news article. So in the news article, it's black and white, but here we can tell from the slide, like the color of her dress, which is a blue and white plaid day dress that she's wearing. And so it's sort of like when they color those, the old um, movies. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like that. Like, it's that, it's that exciting to be able to see. Color from black and white photos. Exactly. And then uh, the title of this news article has her name in there. 
Nawa kik keisika. The noonday woman is what it says in here, and is by Eldora Bisaw, Menominee Tribal News staff writer. What I like about this article is like not only does it go through the entire process, but um, one thing that she talks about is uh, different types of hides or like um, uh, different types of deer. And she talks about like a, a spike horn deer and how she didn't like working with them because the spike horns are mean and the hides are just like the animal, mean and hard to work with. <laughs> <laughs> so at the, at the end of the article, it talks about um, a little bit about her background. And what it says here is uh, she is a quiet woman of Potawatomi and Menominee descent and has spent most of her 76 years on the Menominee Indian Reservation. She grew up in what is known as Nakanish Settlement and married Ernest Blackhawk Nakanish in 1930. Blackhawk and Jane moved to Anago, Wisconsin in 1962, and she has resided there ever since. Blackhawk died in February 1977 at age 92. And according to her belief, Jane must live there, live in their little house for a certain length of time after Blackhawk's death. Uh, and it says here, teachers are paid to teach. Jane did not receive any pay. She did it out of the goodness of her heart. And that is what is beautiful. Jane taught Clara, and who they're talking about is uh, Clara Kakatosh in this article. And Clara taught Tom, and, and Tom was uh, Clara's husband. And they all taught students, and one of the students said that he was going to go on to teach the Cub Scouts. And it said, aside from battling such negative elements as the larder beetle, a nervy insect that can ruin a hide, or a skin turning bad, the end result is not only the satisfaction of a beautiful piece of buckskin, but the students can say with truth and pride that I made this, and it all began with Jane. And uh, I don't know if you ever seen like some of um, her work. I don't she, believe so. She's made some beautiful moccasins. That was like one of the things that she was known known among many other of her talents. And uh, the Menominee Cultural Museum, they have um, some photographs of her with her moccasins and also with um, some of her other pieces of traditional art. So like going on past this article... What I thought was interesting that I'd like to share just because we're coming up to powwow season mm -hmm. is they do have some uh, photographs of dancers. So like down here in their applique dresses is Helen Winos. And they also have here the front is says... Eugene Webster Jr. holds two trophies he earned. One left on the left is a trophy he was awarded for boxing in the Junior Nebraska Olympics, and on the right is a trophy for third place in fancy dancing in Canada, where he competed against contestants from Canada and in, and the United States. And Eugene is pictured here in his full fancy dance regalia, holding both trophies. And next to him is Mary Dowd, who has encouraged and instructed many young people to dance. Eugene is one of the young men she has taught. And, and it, it continues the story on page four. So... Um, that's one thing about the Menominee News is um, there's a lot of photographs in here. And like because of the, the level that the technology is at today, how we're able to digitize um, at a high resolution, like we're able to um, get 
clear photos, at least like what is allowable by what remains of the photo here mm -hmm. in here in the newspapers. So you're saying like with digitizing it'll look like how it does in person? It'll look how it does in person, but you can even zoom up and get d into further detail that you might not be able to really notice by looking at the actual original image. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by and showing us these um, awesome finds that you found in the archives. All right. Thank you. So upcoming, we have the powwow. Did you want to discuss like some etiquette? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a good time to do that. So uh, the poll starts on Thursday. Um, some of the questions that we get normally with the poll, well, first and foremost, they're still still available. I believe the, the early button costs, so if people want those, they can come in and get them. Um, they're, they're on sale here at tribal offices um, or poll committee members have those. Um, at the gate, obviously, you can drive up and and buy your buttons or your daily passes once the power starts right at the gate. Uh, elders are free, so basically you can get through. If you're an elder, you don't have to pay. You'll get right through at the gate. Once you're in the powwow, you know, it, it's it's more of a, it's it's sort of a fair setting. So, you know, it's free to walk around. Visitors are, are free to, to um, partake in all of the vendors that are there. And then when it comes to the powwow, um, the two times when uh, you want to see are the two times for grand entry. Obviously, one of them is Friday evening, but Saturday, one and seven. And, and normally what people can do is sit down in the bleachers or the stands and, and spectate and watch that grand entry. That's a good opportunity to do that. Um, filming is fine. We don't have any problems with people filming or taking pictures. You know, people often ask that question, hey, can I take pictures? Oh, yeah, absolutely, you can take pictures. Um, participating in the powwow and dancing is, is available as well. This is a contest powwow. So the difference between a contest powwow and a, and a powwow that isn't a contest powwow is there's less opportunity to participate as an individual because of the contest dances and drumming. Um, but there are what's called intertribal um, dances throughout the Pau. They make them available for people to, to enjoy and, and continue to get involved and participate. Totally welcome to whoever comes visits. Welcome to come down into the arena and enjoy that, that part of the Pau. It's a, it's a pretty big deal for us. And if you haven't ever visited the woodland ball, yeah, you have to see it and have to get down there and participate. It's pretty nice. So. Waiwanan for listening to the MITW podcast. The MITW podcast will be uploaded monthly to keep you up to date with information from the Menominee Tribe and Tribal Departments. You can subscribe to the MITW podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. You can also listen to the podcast on menominee-nsn.gov. If you have any questions or comments, you can email podcast at mitw.org. Follow us on Facebook by liking the MITW Podcast Facebook page.